So hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. In today's video, we're going to be attempting to get the Platinum for Cyberpunk 2077. This game released all the way back in 2020 to uh, mixed reviews. And what greeted mostly everyone that pre-ordered this game was a perfectly balanced and enjoyable experience ready to play on release. Where's the blood from? It yours? I'm 100% sure it's not ours. In the years since, CD Projekt Red have been trying their hardest to fix these issues, and I have to say, they've actually done a really good job. The Edge Runners anime was hands down one of my favorite animes in a while, and with the DLC and 2.0 update approaching way faster than expected, it was now or never to finally delve into the massive world of Cyberpunk 2077. Now, because of how big this game actually is, I had to split this one up into four stages. Stage one, complete the story. Stage two, complete the five character storylines and the endings tied to them. Stage three, 100% all gigs and NCPD missions. And finally, stage four, clean up all the remaining miscellaneous trophies. Just before we head into the video, I'd like to give a massive thank you to the new members of the channel. And I'd also like to let you all know that the Satire Discord has been created if you'd like to talk about Platinums and keep up to date with all future videos. Now, as I'll be going over the majority of the story within this video, if you'd rather not see any spoilers, then be sure to skip ahead to stage three or at this time on the screen right now. But if you're ready to see me take on everything Night City has to offer, then get comfy, grab some snacks and enjoy the video. The game starts out with a choice straight away to determine the life path of V, your character. You can pick between Nomad, Street Kid and Corpo, but to be honest, this choice really only impacts the intro section of the game and later just becomes a few optional dialogue choices. I picked Street Kid because it looked the coolest and customized my character the only way I knew how to. Crazy colored hair, random tattoos all over my body and the best colored grills anyone could ask for. With the customization out of the way, we are quickly introduced to Pepe, an individual who owes a lump sum of money to a guy called Kurt. Kirk. Kirk is a fixer and while we never really see Kirk again, we do run into our fair share of fixers throughout this game. These fixers are pretty much there to dish out their dirty work to anyone looking for a few eddies, which is the currency in this game. Cream ride there on the page. Only four of them in NC as of now. Number four will belong to my client, just as soon as you clap it for me that is. I do this and Pepe's debt is squared. Of course, I'm a man of my word, you know that. Once entering the car park, we can find the rayfield that Kirk wants us to steal. But before even attempting to steal it, this happens. Get the fuck up. Don't move! You're under arrest! Stay where you are! Are these the thieves? Fuck ordinary dear. street trash. Got him in custody, Mr. Fujioka. We'll be taking them now. It's a waste of effort. I have no time to testify or play it on an investigation. Suggesting we let them go, sir? I suggest you toss them in the sea. Conflict's broken so this trash doesn't float. You heard him. <sighs> Fuck. After somehow getting let off with no repercussions, we join forces with Jackie and start doing our own jobs instead of working for a fixer. Elevator. Jackie then introduces us to Dexter Deshaun, who quickly becomes our fixer and sends us on our first mission to retrieve a flathead that he rightfully paid for. Pimped out prototype actuators made of titanium vanadium Kevlar composite. Yeah, we'll take it. Free. Sure. Yeah. Let's see your cred. Brick got it. It's all paid up. Brick got it. Huh. I don't see any fucking brick around here, do you? This then turns into a massive fight and we have no choice but to take the flathead and run, eventually sneaking past all the guards and making it out alive. Dexter Deshaun later introduces us to Evelyn, a troubled woman who has a BD for us to watch. These BDs are used a few times throughout this game and I personally think they're a really cool feature. The BD lets you relive a moment in time from the perspective of another person and then go through that timeline looking for visual and audio clues to aid us in the right direction. In this case, Evelyn somehow managed to get into Arasaka Tower, specifically into the most important room of the tower with Yorinobu Arasaka. This guy is of pretty high importance and is a son of Saburu Arasaka, who is the leader of Arasaka. I know this is pretty complicated, but stay with me and it will all make sense eventually. 
The BD takes us through the apartment as Evelyn, as we try to find any information on the relic that Dexter Deshawn wants. After watching a few private scenes and listening in on Yorinobu's phone call, we can finally unlock the thermal setting and, because the relic has to be stored in extremely low temperatures, found out exactly where it was fairly easily. Right, grab the heat sig. Matches the spec in the docks. Yorinobu's got the case here, guaranteed. I forgot to mention that we do run into Judy here too, who becomes very important later on in the video. But for now though, she gives us the BD headset free of charge, and after stressing a little bit about the BD falling into the wrong hands, we leave Judy behind before Evelyn proposes a deal. V, do this job for me. I mean me alone. No splitting the payout with anyone else. No middlemen. No decks. If I agree, there'll be hell to pay, for sure. I know. Whatever you decide, it stays between us. After this, we end up going to the afterlife and decide to get a drink with Jackie, before meeting up with Dexter Deshawn once again to get briefed over the task at hand. He explains that the mission is pretty simple. Break into the heavily guarded tower with the flathead, take a highly prized relic worth thousands of eddies, and escape, all without being caught. This seemed way too good to be true, because it was, but we arrived at Arasaka Tower anyways, and tried our luck at entering through the main entrance. <clears throat> Hold on. Got something. Care to explain why you're bringing military equipment onto the premises into Compeki Plaza? We're arms dealers. Excuse me? Ah, you are here to see Taki-san, am I right? Please, accept my apologies for the confusion. After somehow completely waffling our way through and arriving at the room located beneath Yorinobu's apartment, we can use the flathead from earlier to scout the area around the room using the vents. We eventually find a netrunner locked into the building's mainframe and after neutralizing him, now have access to the entire building's security features. This was one of the few victories we had before heading into Yorinobu's apartment a few hours later. Once inside, we can steal Yorinobu's pistol and eventually unlock the safe containing the relic, only to be interrupted by the one person who we had spent this entire time trying to avoid. Blake, your nobu's about to walk in. Find cover. Where? That pillar. Try that. You fucking kidding? No. Inside it now. We're in. Which don't solve our problem, T. I fucking know our problem's still there. Let me think for a sec, okay? With V and Jackie now stuck inside the pillar, we witness Adam Smasher for the first time. If you've seen the anime, then I'm sure you're pretty familiar. We're having a moment! But if not, Adam Smasher is Arasaka's head of security and one of the most powerful individuals you'll probably meet in Cyberpunk. The biggest threat right now was trying to escape the apartment alive without being spotted by Yorinobu, and this looked pretty promising until it didn't. Saburo Arasaka? The Emperor? Yet another ass licking legend. So now, we were stuck inside the pillar with the relic, surrounded by not only Adam Smasher and Yorinobu, but also the leader of Arasaka, Saburo, and his bodyguard, Takamura, as well. That was until Yorinobu choked his own father to death after he found out that he wasn't subscribed to the channel. Huh? This gave us the green light to escape without anyone even realizing we were there. But of course, there was no way it would be that easy. With the relic's bio-integrity going down every second, Jackie decides to take the hero route and saves the relic from destroying itself, slotting it inside his chip port, which unfortunately leads to a decrease in his own health over time. Before thinking about that though, the main priority was to escape Arasaka Tower alive. And to do this, we had to fight through countless enemies and even the first semi-boss fight of the game that I cheesed by camping behind this ledge with my shotgun. Delamain, got it! We'll have problems if you don't fucking cry! Not bad. Client feedback noted. How's our ride looking? Tip top. Though alas, we are being pursued. Sweet fucking shit! Tell me! Please remain calm. Calm! Roadblock ahead. I climb as well! We do manage to lose the enemies on our tail, but eventually, with the chip slowly deteriorating Jackie's health, alongside him already being severely injured from the fall, it was only a matter of time before the inevitable happened. My medical diagnostics indicate that Mr. Wells' condition is critical. It's gonna be alright, huh? You'll see Misty, your mom, everyone you love. Jackie, don't close your eyes. <sighs> Misty. 
Hush, no. She always knew. Stay here and don't move. I'll be right back. Understood. Mr. Deshaun awaits you in room number 204. We stop off outside No Tell Motel to meet up with Dex, who seems extremely annoyed with how bad this heist went. So annoyed, in fact, that he decides the best course of action is to remove this entire situation from existence, including us. Can't risk it, V. Remember our first Dex, combo? What the fuck? Seems I've chosen the quiet life after all. No blaze of glory for me. With V seemingly no more, we awake inside the memory of another character. You know, the guy from Fortnite. We finish up a concert and straight away head into a chopper gunner to mow down a group of innocent people. It is here that we can unlock our first combat related trophy of the game while attempting to blow up Arasaka Tower. Because Johnny Silverhand's gun is so powerful, it pretty much one shots any enemy we come across and in turn unlocks the trophy Gun Fu for eliminating three enemies in quick succession. With the bomb primed and the virus uploaded onto the system, we can attempt to escape the building before it blows up and takes us down in the process. Smasher. Told you, Johnny boy. Told you I'd end you someday. After being obliterated by Adam Smasher, we arrive at the Militech offices with one HP remaining. We witness the aftermath of the explosion before Johnny's consciousness is transferred onto a shard using Soul Killer. We get a glimpse at Johnny here before being transported back to the real world in a landfill covered in metal sheets and old junk. Ugh, heavier than he looks. Now, listen, dog. I have done exactly what you asked. So let's you and me figure this out. Arasaka-sama, Otoo-sama no sasugai hao nitsukemashita. You hear me? I need your help. After defeating a good chunk of enemies that are for some reason on our tail, Takamura seeks our help and we end up back at Vix for a few repairs. Saying I experienced another Psyche's memories? How's that possible? You two are connected in a way I can't make head or tail of. Two? Me and who, Vic? <laughs> Who's the other? Johnny Silverhand, a terrorist. Real talk of the town back in my day. The biochip. It's basically a bomb. Fuse lit already. You don't have much time left. Much... life. A few weeks tops. Silverhand's construct is overriding your consciousness. Gradually taking over your body until... one day you'll just be... gone. V. It's important you get all this. You'll fix me up, right? Vic? If I could, I would, V. Believe me. But this is... It's way beyond what I know how to do. After hearing the worst news possible, we get taken back to our apartment by Jackie's girlfriend, and she gives us two sets of tablets. Omega blockers. 
Taken regularly, they'll keep things from progressing too quickly. Pseudoendotrizines from me. Effect will be opposite. It'll speed things up. Free the demon, so to speak. Now, I just want to quickly point out that I did play this game about a year ago, and back then, I did earn a few trophies before dropping the game for something else. Most of these trophies will be placed in their correct spots throughout the video, so it won't really make much of a difference. But the trophy right back at you was earned in a mission that I never ended up attempting this time around. I haven't got any footage for this one other than the actual trophy notification, but essentially, you just have to eliminate an enemy after they've thrown a grenade at you, and the trophy will pop. Moving on, the next task at hand was to meet Takamura at Tom's diner, where he begs us to find Evelyn as she was the closest person to Yorinobu. V on the other hand wants to find the person that made the chip in hopes that it can be removed from our chip port before it's too late. Before we can decide though, we can unlock another trophy for picking V's dialogue options 10 times. This one was also unlocked in my previous playthrough and I chose the Corpo lifestyle instead of Street Kid, which is why the options are a little bit different. Takamura then presses us for an answer on who we want to find first, the Relic's engineer or Evelyn Parker. I chose Evelyn here, but I don't really think it matters too much since we end up exploring both options anyways. After arriving at Lizzie's bar, we can make our way downstairs to Judy, where it turns out Evelyn has been missing for a few days. She lets us know that Evelyn works at Clouds, so our best interest is to head there first. Upon arriving at Clouds, I realized pretty quickly that this was a place for your deepest desires, and straight away, you're greeted with a screen to choose your doll. The thing is, these dolls are actually real humans, and they use a chip specifically to delete their memory once all things are said and done. Now, V wasn't here for a quick turnaround, he was here for answers, and that's why we end up in bed with one of the dolls. Samurai. Oh, what's going on? I need to talk to you. Talk? You pulled the emergency brake, ripped me out just to talk? Evelyn Parker, what do you know about her? Not much. Everyone's got their own booths, their own problems, their own little bubbles. You ought to ask Tom. Two of them were inseparable, gossiping for hours on end. After finding Tom, we quickly get told that the person we need to find is Woodman. He's the person in charge and if anyone knows where Evelyn is, it has to be him. So, after sneaking my way through the restricted area with zero casualties, we eventually find the man we are looking for. Well, aren't you the king of fuck-ups? You're not helping. Now what? Sold her off to a ripper. Ship was busted. Could have sent her to get it patched up. A ripper named Fingers in a back alley for hookers. Sounds like a Joy Toy's wet dream. On the way to meet Fingers, we witness the first side effects of the chip taking place and end up getting into a conversation with Johnny where it's explained that the only way we will ever solve this chip problem once and for all is to head back into Arasaka Tower and link into Mikoshi. Mikoshi is the place that contains all the engrams of everyone taken by the Soul Killer and I believe Johnny was there too until his engram was placed onto the chip. He also briefly mentions an individual called Alt Cunningham but she fails to play a part until a bit later on in the story. For now, we can head to the Ripper Dock known as Fingers and hold him hostage while we demand answers about Evelyn's whereabouts. Point? Ah, yes. Well, I haven't the faintest idea where she is. You're scum. Pathetic. A waste of words. I'm a hair away from putting you down. Two beefers from a BD studio took her. Didn't even know their names. Want details, damn it. Name the studio. They mentioned a moth, of all things. Virtues with the death's head. Said she'd be good for the moth. With Fingers giving us the BD studio's name, we can track down a local BD dealer and buy one of the BDs made by Death's Head. After skimming through the BD and collecting all the necessary information, V and Judy quickly realize that there is only one place that Evelyn can possibly be in this completely remote and random warehouse. All right, let's do this. Wait for my signal. Here goes. Ready? And... Now!
Now that Evelyn is finally back home safe, Judy decides to scan her behavioural chip and stumbles across a BD that explains how she got into this mess in the first place. She got tied in with the wrong crew of netrunners that asked her to take the relic from Dexter to Sean for a good price. She then hired us to do her dirty work, which is why she offered us a chance to give her the relic instead of Dexter. There was another BD which reveals that the netrunners only wanted the chip for Johnny's construct in order to reach Old Cunningham, but as it stands right now, neither V or Johnny have any idea why Old is needed so badly. To find out though, we call up the man himself, Mr. Hands, and pray that he can get us in touch with the Voodoo Boys. After waiting a few days, we are introduced to someone called Placide, and he promises to let us talk to someone higher up as long as we do a job for him. The job at hand is to clear out this entire shopping mall, eliminating every enemy standing in the way before linking up to this van to gain information on a stranger hiding out in the mall. Okay, so what's on me to do? You must reach the agent. Easy now to find him. Look at the map. He is in cinema. Step away now. This isn't your fight. Matt. What? Placide, what? They're caught. Pushed out. The runner know you are here. Hunt him. This then causes the Netrunner to close all shutters and random exits in the mall, forcing us into a direct path with death. You need to hold Come at me! Bring it! This boss fight was actually pretty difficult for me because I didn't have the best weapons and the ones I did have weren't doing anywhere near enough damage. The boss was a massive bullet sponge, however, I powered through and with only 5 bullets left in my name, finished the boss off once and for all. We eventually catch up with the netrunner and he tries his best to convince us that the voodoo boys are bad. I probably should have listened to him because he had some really good points, but instead, he took a submachine gun to the face. What? Link was dead. Situation under control. The net pig was right. Voodoo's were blowing smoke. Soon as you gave them access to the net watch web, they roasted all the agents. And you. Then why is my brain not a pile of hot goo? Don't know, you finally grew a pair, toughed it out. With the chip coming in clutch once again, we decide to give Placide an unexpected welcome and run into the leader of the Voodoo Boys, Brigitte, who promises to sort out our chip problem if we can help her first. If you remember from the BDs, the Voodoo Boys are only interested in one thing, Old Cunningham, and if we can get them Old, then the chip problem should be solved, probably. We are told to get in the ice bath and a place inside the net. Bridget also joins us and explains that the link between Johnny and V's neural network has been enhanced, allowing us to scan through any memories of Alt and in turn allows us to experience them for ourselves. We witness a few disagreements between Alt and Johnny before we are jumped by a group and are stabbed in the back by a guy with two blades. This then results in Alt being kidnapped and after waking up from surgery, immediately go ahead and storm Arasaka Tower to try and get her back. I have to say, these missions with Johnny were some of my favourites in the game. His pistol is crazy overpowered and the missions always end up being full of combat, so it's a win-win for me. Once making it through all of the Arasaka guards, we do end up reaching Alt, only to find out that she is no longer with us. Hey, you hear me? Alt. Alt, come she... on, don't do this! Fuck! Johnny. The hell are you doing? Are you still rolling? This is all... No. Won't change her. She's not... Stop that! You have to kill him? Uh, 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 we gotta go. Uh, Johnny! She's dead. We eventually break through the black wall and find Alt in her net form. She explains that the most help she can give is to split V and Johnny's engram up into two, keeping Johnny's engram in the net while V can return back to his body alone. The only issue is though, we have to get into Mikoshi, the server inside Arasaka Tower, and obviously that place is heavily guarded and impossible to get to. The promise is made though, and if we are able to get there, she will keep her word and turn everything back to normal.
Now, you're gonna have to put this side of the story on hold for a bit because the next mission introduces us to Rogue, someone that Johnny was super close to before he died and also someone who becomes pretty important later on. For now though, we are only here for some intel on a guy called Anders Hellman as he is supposedly the creator of the chip. Rogue pulls a few strings and after giving her 15,000 eddies, she's happy to help us locate Hellman and refers us to Panam Palmer. Panam just lost her van and a few other things so the blackmail was set. We would seek her help first in return for her van and other goods. But this didn't really end up going to plan. This thing between you and Rogue couldn't care less. Got a job for you. Good. But I'm overextended at the moment. With the merch and your car, getting them back, I can help with that. The rail freight yard on Benita Street. The one hugging the city line. We'll meet there. You always on the warpath? Only when someone tries to jerk me around. Where the hell is my car? I tell you, and then what? Gonna storm off, handle it all by yourself? All right, deal. But if you want your thing done, we'll need to get my Thornton back first. The best and only way to grab her van without being spotted was to stroll up at this junction, turn the electricity off, and wait patiently for the group to arrive. <laughs> and then we headed back to a random motel where V tries his best to get lucky with Panam. Maybe we rent just one room. Good idea. Noah has two twin beds in every room. We'll save some money. Not quite what I had in mind. Just what did you have in mind? Just, um, uh, <clears throat> glad to have met you. <laughs> so I thought... I'm glad we met too. That could have been a damned tough day. But thanks to you, it all went well. Maybe... calls for a... Uh... Little celebration? Oh my god. Sure. Oh, we can celebrate. Man. What the fuck, man? But not today. I'm good. The next mission with Panam is easily one of my favorites in the game. V and Panam slowly get closer with each other. We EMP this entire side of the map and Panam brings out her rocket launcher, shooting down the convoy containing Hellman. The one and only negative to this entire situation was that the EMP cut out communications with her crew, leading to Mitch and Scorpion tailing the convoy without realizing it's full of enemies. We try our best to get there on time, but once arriving, Hellman is nowhere to be seen and Mitch couldn't be in a worse situation. We couldn't reach they regrouped so fast. Started shooting rockets and shit. I lost everyone. Everyone? Scorpion, is he here? Mitch? Mitch? He's... He's safe, right? Pan Am, I'm sorry. I didn't make it in time. No! No! Are you sure? No, he... Pan Am, listen. I know it's not the best time, but I need Hellman. You promised to help. That still hold? I always keep my word. Mitch, I will find those sons of bitches. I swear. With Scorpion being lost to the enemies, Panam is out for blood and so ready to get revenge that she starts hovering off the ground. We do eventually find Hellman, bringing him back to the motel where Takamura and V question him on the chip's construct. Nah, this heat, my throat is positively parched. It is also at this point that we start to see a change of heart in Johnny. It seems that he started to realize that if V ends up dying, he also dies too. And this is when he starts to become more helpful than just being there for decoration. Putting the Panam storyline on hold for a bit, we are tasked with helping Takamura avenge the death of Saburo Arasaka, the guy that was strangled to death at the beginning of the game. To do this, we meet up with a guy from Arasaka that lets us know that the sister, Hanako, will be attending the parade in a few days. The parade is easily the best place to get close enough to her, allowing us to hopefully tell her what Yorinobu did to Saburo in person. The only preparation we really need to do for this is sneaking into an Arasaka warehouse and while this really didn't go to plan overall the mission was a success and we end up hacking into the float that will be used in the parade. A little while later the night of the parade is upon us and the mission is ready to go. There are three snipers standing in the way of meeting Hanako face to face so our task is to parkour around the broken hallways, taking out each sniper one by one. The third sniper was a bit trickier than the other two, just due to the amount of enemies unintentionally guarding the sniper. 
There were two in the way here, another one here, a drone flying around outside with aimbot, and to top it all off, mines right behind the sniper that should have killed me, but actually ended up assisting me instead. Even with the three snipers down, Takamura explains that a netrunner is jamming the signals, and without taking her out, blocks our access to the float that we hacked. So of course, this becomes our next task, and we head down to deal with what I thought would be a pretty simple situation. Been on a while, time for a break. Fuck! Turns out, the guy from the meeting earlier is also a highly skilled ninja with an invisibility cloak. This is probably the easiest fight of the entire game, and I think my weapons played a big part in that. The invisibility gimmick was cool, but once you figure out that shooting him once reveals his location, it becomes pretty easy to counteract. I did try to finish him off with an epic 360 no scope, but he ended up getting away before I could even turn around. Okay, Preem. Online and in the system. Hanako's inside. What is she doing? Trying to call someone, I think. Hanako-sama. Anata wa? Oiru shi wo. Douka, hanashi dake demo o kiki kudasai. Saburo-sama wa? Shichi no koto o kuchi ni shinai. Kore ga ore ni dekiru saigo no gohoshi na no desu. Saburo-sama no shi ni tsuite shinjitsu o akasu koto ga. Hanako-sama, bure o hatarakita ke arimasen. Shikashi. V, run! Shit, shit, shit. He shot her. Well, now we're really fucked. Knew we couldn't trust him. What happened to keeping him on his leash? Now, in this situation, both V and Johnny are under the impression that Takamura shot Hanako, and to be honest, so was I. The most annoying thing about the situation is that the game makes zero effort to actually explain this until Hanako randomly appears alive and well in the next mission, leaving me extremely confused. Either way, this mission is an important one because it houses the path to the first missable ending and is actually the only one that would require a new playthrough had you missed this section entirely. As we are explaining the situation to Hanako, this happens. Did you hear that? Go and check. I got a bad feeling about this. They have found us! Damn it! On the ground, asshole! Don't move! And when we finally wake up, we are tasked with escaping the building. But by crawling through this hole in the wall and taking out all the enemies in the area, we are then tasked with saving Takamura. This is why it's such a missable ending, because the game gives absolutely no hints that this is even a possible route to take. After saving him and escaping alive, we end up back to the motel where Hanako sends a doll to speak on her behalf. I have a message for V. Don't touch that door. Are you asleep? Time to wake up! It's a doll. Poor proxy. I must make one thing clear. I still think you are mad. But... Hanako. That you? But I can fool myself no longer. I believe you. Okay. So now that you know and believe, what's next? Yorinobu planted a tanto in the corporation's very heart. I must act while the wound is fresh, and you will help me. You are living proof of his crime and treason. You're gonna help me first. Perhaps I did not speak clearly. We must act quickly. Well, I'm pretty tight on time too. Dying, in fact. Let us meet in person, at Ember's, in the city center. It is discreet. With a solid plan in place, we head out the hotel door and pretty much die instantly, only to wake up in a random location with Johnny. We have a heart-to-heart -heart conversation and we both agree to take a bullet for each other. Johnny also agrees that he will sacrifice himself to let us keep our body, but he has one more request to ask for. Adam Smasher, fucker who got the better of me. Whatever happens to me, I want him zero, gone, tossed into the wind as mulch. And I want Rogue to be there with you. It's important to me, and it's just as important for her. So, I gotta tell Rogue... everything? Think I'd better do that. Handle it personally. You'll drop the pills from Misty, and I'll steer the ship for a bit. I'm not at all excited about this plan. Realize that, right? 
Just gonna have a quick chat with Rogue about Smasher. Then I'm out, I promise. This request comes into play as another ending, so for now, we head to Hanako to speak about the task at hand. I can lead you to Mikoshi. Meaning? Mikoshi don't exist in real space. Yet its access points do, and one is very near. Where? Here in Night City, beneath Arasaka Tower. My brother... You catch a whiff of that? Smells like shit. Careful not to step in it. He must be made to take responsibility for his deeds. I want the Arasaka Corporation to know the truth. How you plan to do this? Yorinobu will soon call a meeting of the board. Representatives of all factions are expected to attend. The perfect moment for them to learn the circumstances of my father's death. I will get you into this meeting, and you will testify against my brother. Testify? Listen, mind if I'm straight with you? Help me get rid of Yorinobu. I will help you get rid of the construct. We head into the elevator before passing out once again. Only this time, we end up at Vix and learn that our health has gotten so bad that it is beyond any form of repair. Just give it to me straight, Vic. Next attack, you will be able to crawl back here. You'll flatline in some back alley. This is your last chance to take matters into your own hands. Understand? After explaining the severity of the situation, he gives us two options, a gun and a few pills. And after heading to the roof with Misty, we pick out how we want to tackle the issue at hand. The first choice I chose was for ending it all right there and then. However, after ending my life and watching the credits, not a single trophy popped. So I reloaded and this time we carried on the story, helping Hanako avenge her father. We chill with Misty for a bit before being picked up by Takamura and surprisingly Hellman too, who questions us on our loyalty because Johnny blew up Arasaka Tower before he died. This is all brushed under the rug though, as we neutralize a pretty large amount of enemies just to reach Hanako and then ride over to Arasaka Tower to finally reach Mikoshi. There was no way that Hanako would let us use Mikoshi though, instead showing us something much more interesting. Fuck me, Dizzy. With Saburo now in engram form, we head to the board meeting to announce the truth about his murder to the Arasaka members. Yorinobu murdered my father and exploited his death to justify his warmongering. And you knew of this. All of you. Fascinating. Absurd. Careful what you say. Yes, indeed. Words and nothing else. Is this all you have? I have an eyewitness. It's true. All of it. Saw it with my own eyes. What did you see? I saw Yorinobu strangle Saburo Arasaka. Ah, more interesting with each minute. If our testimony is not enough, perhaps you will listen to my father. Misangi hateta yasurami. Arasaka-sama. Akabu no yoo ni mamma to damasareta ka. Hiyorimi shugi ni hashitta ka. Arasaka-sama, what is your command? Who activated the lockdown? Is it you? Is this your doing, Hanako? To lock us in here so we devour each other like rats in a cage? Hear that? Have you brought more of this filth from the street? I asked. Here he is. After eliminating all the enemies sent our way, we head up the elevator to be greeted with yet again more enemies. This was a pretty tedious section, but once I figured out that you could pick the turret off the ground, the enemies started dropping like flies. What I don't think was meant to happen though, was being allowed to bring this turret to the biggest fight of the game. It's easy. Your mate is fucking... Oh, fuck. 
Adam Smasher comes in out of nowhere for the final fight of the game. And while this was such a cool way to finally meet him, it was over way quicker than was probably intended. <laughs> How about that, Johnny? With Adam Smasher being the final hurdle of the game, we can make it to Yorinobu after all this time to finally put a stop to this once and for all. To me, it kind of seems that Yorinobu got away pretty lightly, all things considered, but that really wasn't the point of this trip. The whole reason we were here in the first place was to get access to Mikoshi, and after riding the elevator with Hellman, we can do exactly that, earning us the first missable trophy of the game for helping Takamura avenge the death of Saburo Arasaka. I don't want to drag this out. Just see you around, Johnny. And thanks for everything. If not for you, I'd be long dead. Several times over. After saying our goodbyes to Johnny, we wake up from surgery, seemingly free of Johnny's presence. We spend the next few months doing simple tasks like solving Rubik's Cubes, going on the treadmill, and answering the same question over and over again. At the same time, it turns out Yorinobu offered up his body to be taken over by Saburo's engram, and thus taken over his body and becoming himself once again. Eventually, V gets sick of doing the same thing every single day and goes sicko mode, breaking everything in the room. We get a visit from Takamura and he brings us the worst news possible as the surgery apparently did nothing. The best outcome to this situation is to join Arasaka's Save Your Soul program, eventually replicate what happened with Yorinobu's body and Saburo's engram. With that being our only option, we sign our soul away and sit in the chair to hopefully be awoken sometime in the future. How's the earth looking from way up there? She is pretty as they say. And with that ending out of the way, the game is now over and the first missable ending is complete. Stage two is up next, requiring us to complete the five character storylines and the missable endings tied to them. Now, to save a bit of time and to also make things a bit easier, I won't be going over every single storyline in the game because this took around five to 10 hours to get them all done and going over each one will probably make this video a lot longer than it already is. What I will do though, is go over the ones that link to the missable endings as the endings are really, really interesting and add a lot to the storylines tied to them. Here are the trophies for the ones that I won't be going over. See you later, V. And just as a quick honorable mention, there is an absolutely amazing section in Judy's storyline that has you scuba diving underwater in her hometown. This is by far one of, if not the coolest missions in the game, and for it to be technically missable is criminal. Hockey stick? Is there a skating rink here? I wish. Played street hockey on rollerblades. Quit schmoozing, Alvarez. We're losing because of you. Coming. Coming. You're dead meat anyway. 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 Go out with me. Go out Sorry, you gotta go. They're calling. They're calling. They're calling. Let's keep going, Judy. Aye, aye, Captain. Follow me. Hollow sometimes. I see you, Judy. And now, I think it's about time we start the best storyline in the game with Panam. Spit it out. The raids took salt. The Brick Brain ventured out with a small patrol and never came back. Sure it was wraiths? We've been observing their camp. We know they're holding prisoners, including someone important. We need to free Saul. I don't know why, but I felt I could count on you. With Panam seeking our help, we go scout out the race camp before heading there ourselves to seek out the best point of entry. I tried a few ways to get in before jumping over this truck and sneaking past every single guard. Making it to Saul was surprisingly no issues. I tried my luck on the way out too, but this time we were spotted and caused a pretty long chase sequence. With a mixture of the sandstorm, moving car, and just my bad aim, I really wasn't much help in keeping us alive. 
Luckily, we made it back to a random house in the middle of nowhere and set up camp for the night. We can talk to Panam for a bit until V gets carried away and jumps the gun, sending Panam straight to sleep. The topic is never brought up again and she even rewards us with a pretty powerful sniper rifle, so I think V got off pretty lightly, all things considered. Moving on to the next mission, Panam is seemingly having a few troubles with Saul as he wants to lead the camp one way and she feels it should be led the other way. They clash and in retaliation, Panam decides that she wants to steal a military grade basilisk to better protect the people of the camp. We are sent out to a nearby control station and it is here that we do some average cyberpunk stuff to gain control of the train. This train will be used to block the road that Militech is using, making it extremely easy to take the basilisk with no problem. We witness a turning point in our relationship with Panam as she admits that she feels some type of way towards us too. When I do something spontaneously, I feel I'm being honest. Yet with you, I prefer to play it safe. Why is it any different with me? Because I truly care this time. Yet I fear I'll do or say something foolish and be left alone in the desert. I would rather keep you close. If only as a friend. Try following the impulse next time. Okay. Well, in any case, you've been warned. And then we can head down to the campfire and she falls asleep on our shoulder. When we awake, the train is prepped and blocks Militech right in their tracks, leading to the group to eliminate the enemies and take the basilisk back to the camp. What's the meaning of this? Exactly what you see. The basilisk. All I see is two trucks with giant Militech logos on them. Fuck, Pan Am, you can see them from miles away. You think we don't have problems enough on our hands? The Raffins could rear their heads at any moment. And now we have Militech to worry about too. Stop it! Fuck! Just shut up already! Do you want to serve corporations forever? Fine, go right ahead. In that case, we'll leave the Basilisk as a souvenir of what this family used to be. Or you know what? Maybe next time we're attacked, we'll be able to fight back! In the final mission of Panam's storyline, we are invited back to the camp in order to do a test ride in the Basilisk. And in doing so, end up doing more than I expected with Panam that I really can't show on YouTube. The fun is cut short when Militech inevitably track down their stolen Basilisk, and we are required to fight our way back to the camp, making sure to eliminate every single one of them. Come on, Saul. If I have to leave the clan, please just say so. Spare me another speech of yours at the very least. I'm afraid you'll have to sit through a few more. Because from this day forward, you will lead this family by my side. I will what? I wish to do this properly, but fine. Have it your way. I was wrong. You were right. That's the truth. May it never happen again. But I, I, I made a mess of so many things. You said... I know. But I changed my mind. You risked everything for this family. Not even knowing whether you'd be welcome the next day. Okay. Okay. Well, I... Many things will have to change. Yes, and to start with, we need to leave this place. Quickly. With Panam now given joint leadership of the Aldecaldos, they decide it's best to jump ship and move camp before Militech come back with an army. She invites us along in order to pursue our relationship, but V declines as we had other urgent matters to attend to, before passing out and waking up a few days later at their new camp. Now that Panam knows the situation, she offers her help before giving us a little smooch and ending our storyline for the trophy. With this storyline complete, it opens not one, but two endings that are impacted by dialogue decisions when we head into Mikoshi with Johnny. So for now, we can head up to the roof once again, this time picking the option, gonna ask Panam for help. And then the same conversations happen with Misty while we wait for Panam to pick us up. We pass out yet again, but awake to Mitch briefing us on the situation. Because Panam is technically the leader of the Aldecados, she makes the decision for the entire group to storm Arasaka Tower together, just for V to get access to Mikoshi. We also speak to Alt, who lets us know Know that she's on board with our plan and that she will help us split up Johnny and V. With all the talk about Storm in the Tower, the group are understandably uneasy about helping an outsider, and Saul decides that the time is right to make us one of his own. It's a simple matter. We, all of us standing here, owe you. And it's a great debt. Speak for yourself, Saul. But in spite of that, you're still an outsider. A mercenary from Night City. What might as well be another world. Hey, he's fixing! You're gonna be an Aldecaldo which means this family will go to hell and back for you. Ready, kid? Do your worst. You're one of us now, B. You're an Aldecaldo, dammit. 
Great to Thanks have for you everything, with us, V, and don't worry. We'll get you into that Mikoshi. Isn't that the Welcome way of it? Welcome to the family. V? Jack, it's incredible. See? He likes it. Listen, as soon as we're back from Mikoshi, we'll celebrate. And I know just the place. My treat, of course. It's not all good news as Panam starts to have second thoughts about the entire thing due to the fact that she's leading a bunch of people to their death over a guy she literally fell in love with a few days ago. The next day starts the beginning of no return. We storm into an Arasaka base and take out every single enemy, which actually pops a nice little trophy for eliminating 300 enemies with ranged weapons. We clear out the remaining enemies and head into the basilisk with Panam to enter the one unguarded tunnel leading straight towards Arasaka Tower. Now that we were inside, we can sneak past a bunch of Arasaka guards and plug ult into the mainframe, eliminating every single enemy in the entire floor for ease of access into Mikoshi. Well, every enemy but one. This time around, the Smasher fight was a little bit harder with the weapons I had, but the outcome was still the same. Smasher, zero, satire two. We head into Mikoshi where Alt gives us a choice. Either we split from Johnny and return to our normal complete self, or we give up our body, letting Johnny use it instead. Both endings are pretty cool, and the first one I picked was of course, to keep our body and return back to Panam without Johnny. This ending is probably my favorite one of the entire game. The storyline is actually incredible, and the fact that you can just play this game and not experience the character progression is crazy. We look over Night City with Panam, soaking it in for a few minutes, before heading off towards Mitch and the group in order to leave Night City once and for all. We end up meeting at an undisclosed location, close to an old smuggling tunnel that is the perfect size to fit the basilisk through undetected from the border patrol. And then, V and Panam jump into the basilisk, starting the journey to the end of this amazing story. How's life out there in the desert? With that incredible ending complete, we can now reload the save and head back into Mikoshi once more, this time letting Johnny take our body instead. We wake up as Johnny and eventually meet a kid called Steve, who aspires to be a musician, but his dad refuses to let him have any fun. With Steve's help, we head off to the guitar store to grab a new guitar, testing out a few strings and probably playing a song that will get me copyrighted. We teach Steve the ropes and head off to one final location, V's grave, to drop off a necklace with the bullet that almost killed us at the start of the game. With all of our deeds complete, we catch a bus and leave the guitar inside of Steve's car, giving him the best gift that he would have never accepted himself. Hey, get off! Wait! The guitar! You forgot your guitar! No, I didn't. Haven't forgotten a thing. Never will. Avi, I know you're a free bird and all. With the two endings linked to Panam's storyline complete, the only other ending is tied to Rogue's storyline. This one carries on from Johnny's request earlier, asking him to have some time alone with Rogue by letting him take control. So of course, we do exactly that, but it doesn't really go to plan. I'll call. I'll call. Ruby, focus. I need to talk to Grayson. When we wake up, 
it wasn't all for nothing as Johnny somehow found out from the woman in the crash that we can find Adam Smasher through a guy called Grayson and also the key word Ebonike. Rogue is actually somehow on board with this entire thing as she truly believes that Johnny is inside of us and wants to help out as best as she can. She finds out that Ebonike is at a random shipping yard and before heading over there gives us Johnny's jacket and also his glasses inside the pocket. We end up getting a load of Johnny's stuff in this mission and it all progresses towards the trophy breathtaking for collecting all of his belongings. We arrive at the shipping yard, defeating countless enemies before slotting into the computer to realize that Ebonike is actually the name of a boat docked up in the yard. And after dealing with a few more of these enemies, we find Grayson in what I assume was meant to be a shootout, but the game glitched and instead we got this. Grab the gun. We take Grayson's gun, which turns out to be Johnny's, and after interrogating him a little bit, find out where Johnny was buried after Smasher killed him. There is also an optional item of Johnny's to be collected here too, for keeping Grayson alive and receiving the keys to a container. This container houses Johnny's old vehicle, and to be honest, after nearly 50 years, it's in really good shape. Upon arriving at the location of Johnny's grave, it's easy to see that he was never buried respectfully and, if anything, probably wasn't even buried at all. There are a few dialogue options here that are easy to mess up and lead to the storyline ending right here with no trophy. Of course, with a guide, I managed to make it through and after helping Johnny get over his burial, ring Rogue to plan a date between the two of them. And after grabbing her from the afterlife, break into the drive-in cinema that they used to use and let Johnny take over one last time to finally get his happy ending with Rogue. Rogue. I'm here on borrowed time in a borrowed body, but I'm here. Johnny, I can't. It's not right. <sighs> Meaning not fair to V? Not fair to you. Tried so hard to pretend nothing's changed. To pretend I'm the same rogue you knew. Actually managed to fool myself for a little. <sighs> Get back on my own. Rogue! Fuck. Wrapped in crepe paper. And with the final storyline now wrapped up, we can also wrap up the final ending of the game as well. This time choosing I think you and Rogue should go as the dialogue option to prompt this ending. We arrive at the afterlife, giving Rogue a little smooch before she briefs us on the task at hand. To be honest, the path she lays out is actually really good, but ultimately doesn't go to plan because our helicopter gets shot down from the sky and we have to approach Arasaka Tower from the ground, just like we did with Hanako. What is useful though, are these anti-fall damage boots that let you jump from any height and survive, making it super simple to reach the bottom of the tower once we were in. Start I remember you. Eat shit and die. Fast, fast, and smasher. Interesting. And just like that, Rogue is gone and we are left to fight Adam Smasher alone. Listen to me, you bored son of a bitch. Rogue meant more than you or I ever could. Best there ever was. And you killed her. She knew the risks. Rogue had it in for you finally got what you wanted. You're talking tribe. I killed the old... Don't know shit, Smasher. She finished things off on her own terms. Something you'll never get. Rogue. You were the best. Always. And then we head into Mikoshi one final time. This time being greeted by V, given the option to either return to V's body and keep it forever, or do the right thing and let V have his body back, which of course is what I did. We wake up as V and after collecting a few things, head off to the afterlife where, as it turns out, we have taken Rogue's place to become the legend of the afterlife. We are quickly introduced to Mr. Blue Eyes and are told that a space casino will lose connection to the satellites at a set time, leaving them vulnerable to an attack. This seems like a really good plan, so we hop on board and actually end up going to space, which I really did not see coming.
What's up, kid? Been a while since you came to see old Vic. With all the storylines and endings finally wrapped up, stage two was now complete and we can move on to stage three, the gigs and NCPD missions. This stage was hands down the worst part of this entire game and I really did not have fun while doing these missions. To put it into perspective, there were 86 gigs and 156 NCPD missions, which genuinely took hours upon hours to complete. I think I was held upon these missions longer than I was with the storylines and it wouldn't have been so bad if they weren't so repetitive. The gigs were okay, each fixer from each each district has a set number of gigs to complete, with most of them just being to walk into a hideout, grab a certain intel chip, and escape alive. The real repetitiveness came from the NCPD missions. These were literally all the same, with the only difference being that sometimes you would need to eliminate the group of enemies instead of just grabbing the intel and running off. It wasn't completely a dull experience though, as we earned a few trophies along the way, making getting these missions done a little bit easier. For example, the trophy master crafter for crafting three legendary items. And yes, there is a crafting system in this game but it never really came into use outside the trophies for me personally. And another one called 10 out of 10 for reaching max level in any skill. This was surprisingly tricky due to the trophy guide being so outdated and the only glitch for this trophy being nerfed so badly it was basically impossible to use it anymore. The one and only method I found that still worked was to craft around 300 grenades and then dismantle them for their parts and just constantly repeat the same cycle. This slowly but surely leveled up the crafting skill and before long the trophy was mine. The only other two worth noting here was for eliminating a hundred enemies with melee weapons and for reaching max street cred, which is basically just the highest level in the game. Now, as much as I'm sure you'd all love to sit and watch me complete over 230 identical missions, I feel it's best I skip over these and quickly mention the only gig that really matters, as it counts towards the trophy breathtaking. As you may remember, this trophy is for collecting all of Johnny's belongings, and so far, we have collected his glasses, jacket, gun, and his car in the mission with Rogue, alongside his tank top in the story mission, and also his shoes in another gig that I forgot to record, which is my bad. For this particular gig, we have to break into Kerry Eurodyne's house and steal his guitar. This guy is an old bandmate of Johnny's and actually does have his own storyline that I wasn't super interested in, but either way, once breaking into his house, we can go into his room and steal Johnny's trousers out of his suitcase for the trophy. And with that out of the way, here are the seven trophies related to clearing all the gigs and NCPD missions around the map. Catch you later. Stage four was the only thing standing in the way of the platinum and requires us to clean up all the miscellaneous trophies. And trust me, there is a lot. This game has a wide but very fun range of trophies to obtain. And I think it's best we start with the trophy V for Vendetta. To unlock this one, we have to visit a Ripper dock to have the second heart cyberware fitted. This allows us to be revived after getting eliminated, giving us a second life or I guess a second heart. The task for this trophy is to eliminate the enemy that makes us use a second heart within five seconds of being revived. The trophy Demon in the Shell is up next, and this one requires you to take out three enemies using the Detonate Grenade Quick Hack. Now, this Quick Hack in particular can be found a few ways, but by far the easiest way is to head on over to Pacifica and eliminate a few of these guys just standing around doing nothing. I tried a few times here before testing my luck on another group that actually ended up working in my favor. With the Detonate Grenade Quick Hack installed, all we had to do now was find a group of enemies and use the Quick Hack to eliminate three of them at the same time. I had a really difficult time with the next trophy because it was extremely buggy for me for some reason. That being the trophy Rough Landing for pulling a superhero landing and eliminating two enemies with the damage. This superhero landing can only be done with the Berserk Cyberware, but even then, the landing just doesn't work. Well, it does visually, but it doesn't do any damage. I tried multiple spots, multiple different groups and heights with no damage being dealt whatsoever, even when the landing animation occurs. The solution that most people suggest was to use the tranquilizer dart in order to knock out a few enemies, pick them up and then pile them on top of each other, leaving no room for error. But even with this crazy setup, the trophy still didn't pop. I actually tried this exact setup for at least 25 minutes before in one of my attempts, I accidentally strayed too far away from the enemies and this happened. 
I seriously have no clue why this trophy is bugged the way it is, but I would imagine that they have fixed this with the 2.0 update because they've addressed pretty much everything else. Most of the remaining trophies were a breeze. I eliminated two enemies with one bullet for this trophy and installed cyberware on every available slot for this one. But of course, the fun had to end somewhere and it ended with the trophy Christmas Tree Hack. In this game, there are times where you're prompted with a puzzle of sorts in order to progress forward with the hack. On the right side, there are codes that you need to fill out in order to pass the hack and these are called demons. But most, if not all of the time, I would get one out of three maximum. Now, to get the trophy, you need to get all three of these demons without failing a single one. And this is where it gets really complicated to explain how hard this truly is, because to be honest, I'm not sure how this works either. After attempting and failing at least 30 times, I did manage to get extremely lucky and somehow ended up with a really strong start, leading to the numbers lining up and practically giving me the trophy. <laughs> A really enjoyable trophy was up next called The Quick and the Dead. This was for eliminating 50 enemies with time slowed and I believe the only way to do this is to have the sand devastan fitted by a ripper dock. As soon as I slowed down time, I instantly felt like David from Edrunners and quickly reminded myself that they added the Edrunners update into this game alongside the anime. So I headed to Arasaka Tower and found Rebecca's shotgun, Guts, hiding in the bushes. And then I started a pretty cool side mission where we end up unlocking David Martinez's jacket, which is genuinely such an amazing addition to the game. With these two things now in my possession and also the monowire that Lucy uses being in my possession already, I felt ready to clean up the remaining trophies to this amazing game. First things first, with the sand devastan active, I can shoot a grenade out of the sky for the trophy gunslinger. And then, after a few lengthy side missions, eliminated 50 enemies while slowed to unlock the trophy that started this entire tangent, the quick and the dead. The final trophy left before we head into the lengthier ones is called Must Be Rats and is unlocked for distracting 30 enemies without being spotted. Just being completely honest here, I rarely went into fights trying to be stealthy and because of this, I probably had around 10 to 15 out of the 30 needed for the trophy. The quickest way I found to get this one done was to find an enemy occupied with a TV and just constantly quick hack the TV. For some reason, they won't get startled or try to fight you and the trophy ends up unlocking really soon after. Now we can move on to the last four trophies of the game, with the first one being called Eye on the Law. In this game, there are enemies called Cyber Psychos that suffer from cyber psychosis. This is an illness in the game that happens once you have too much cyberware installed and your brain can't handle it anymore, resulting in a loss of control and a massacre on innocent people. The anime does an amazing job at explaining this if you've seen it already, and I'm pretty sure they added this illness as a feature in the 2.0 update, which is such a great addition. Back to the trophy though, these cyber psychos are scattered all across the map. They aren't hard by any means, and I attempted these while going for the gigs and ncpd missions so it actually became a breath of fresh air to stumble across a cyber psycho while clearing the map out To grab the trophy auto jock, we need to purchase every single car in the game. There's a reason why I left this one to the very end, and it's because you need a total of 1,354,000 eddies to purchase every single vehicle in the game. And after doing every gig, every NCPD mission, every cyber cycle mission, and every random miscellaneous act for the trophies, I still had 300,000 eddies left to collect. This sounds a lot worse than it actually was because after doing a little bit of research, I came across a loophole in this game that may or may not be present in the new update. You have to purchase a legendary schematic from a weapons dealer, craft said weapon, and then sell the weapon back to the dealer for a higher price. This method is easily the best way to attempt this trophy, and after rinsing the dealer dry over the next hour or so, ended up with a good sum of 1.5 million eddies. And then, I went ahead and purchased every single vehicle in the game, which was a bit of a tedious task, but nothing compared to the NCPD missions. For the last two trophies in the game, I just had to go around and find every fast travel location and tarot on the map. The fast travel locations were actually pretty annoying because there are 157 of them scattered all over the map, making it really hard to pinpoint which ones you've already got as they're all clumped together in the districts. The tarots, on the other hand, were really nice and easy to find because there were only 20 instead of 157. Just like the other collectible trophies, the process is not entertaining at all, so I'll skip ahead to the last fast travel point, earning me the trophy Frequent Flyer.
and then jumping ahead to what I thought was the last tarot of the game, only to find out that I was missing one tarot and I actually couldn't figure out where or how I missed one because there was no icon on the map. After at least 10 minutes of being confused and my brain just not working, I realized that the last tarot was hidden behind the final mission marker. And after teleporting to the destination, scanned the last tarot to earn that well-deserved platinum trophy. So after 105 hours of playtime and now finally having that platinum trophy, I can safely say this game is absolutely amazing. I really didn't expect to be blown away by this type of game and yet here I am loving random side storylines and feeling bad for Johnny even though he literally blew up Arasaka Tower. I genuinely can't recommend this game enough and with the 2.0 update being released alongside the DLC, it's literally the perfect time to play this game for yourself and have an amazing experience doing so. Thank you guys as always for watching these videos. I genuinely appreciate every single one of you and i will see you all in the next one bye, -bye.